Here's the lowdown from the low country. Rick Jones here with another edition of From the Bridge. We're going to talk some more today about how I think we can fix the long-term financing of college athletics. And my guest angler is Krista Massey, who has bought and activated a lot of corporate sponsorships at SunTrust Bank, the Home Depot, and Bell South, including a lot of college sports sponsorships. She'll talk about what buyers want to see from sellers. I'll jump back up on that soapbox whether you want me to or not. And we'll discuss another great place to eat on the road with Rick. So let's dive right in. The water's fine. I recently told you that I thought that universities, and these are primarily state universities, and most college athletic departments, uh, they're broken fiscally. Uh, Yes, the virus has contributed to this, but in reality, it's only, in my opinion, accelerated the inevitable. So why are they broken? Well, simply, they don't run their organizations like a business. Number one, they've completely forgotten it's not about them, but rather about their customers. The university has to serve its students and to be profitable, which seems to be a bad word these days in academic circles. They also must serve their communities where they're located. In many cases, they really think their customer It's the state legislators who seem to pay all or most of their bills, (laughs) and and right now all of them when they're in trouble, like during this crisis. Number two, they've outsourced so many things that make other people a profit. (laughs) And so if they kept those profits, those are profits that could be used by the university to do other things. Number three, they have a real lack of financial, fiscal analysis about what we call yield management. When you do a budget annually, you do it based on a return on what you're going to invest. The Walt Disney World is a great example of this kind of yield management. You know, truly, people say Disney is in the entertainment business, and they are from a broad standpoint. But Walt Disney World is really in the land maximization business. They look at an empty piece of land, and they ask these questions. Do we build another theme park or a water park or a hotel or a restaurant, maybe a gas station, maybe even a residential real estate development or perhaps a parking lot? What is needed and what will yield the highest return on that investment? That's what I'm talking about, about yield management. And number four, every university needs to learn to save for a rainy day because we've proven in this pandemic rainy days are coming. They have to quit spending everything they have each and every day. I had a good friend, Scott Falkenberry, who worked a lot for nonprofits, and he once said something memorable. He said, remember, not-for-profit is a tax designation and not a goal. We have too many not-for-profits that think they're not-for-profits. Well, they are, and universities are no exceptions. So here are some recommendations for universities. The first key to success is to make everything except academics an auxiliary of the university and attempt to make everything a profit center with those profits being reinvented back into the university. Secondly, they have to bring a lot of services back in-house. I know it's hard. That's what you get paid for, to do hard things. Take multimedia rights. We all know that over uh, over 90% of sponsorship revenues, and even more at small schools, are local revenues. So why does it take a national firm to sell local sponsorships or to run food services or to run the bookstore or all the other places that universities have outsourced? Thirdly, they now need to see themselves like Disney as being both in the combination of the entertainment business and the real estate business and maximize the real estate they own to use their facilities to create things like concerts or festivals or themed retail or branded food and beverage concepts. They have to make money 365 days a year in every way that they can. Then and only then will they have a truly sustainable 
financial model. I'm going to link today's theme to today's soapbox. Here's a question for you. What would happen to all the businesses near a university if you move that university down the road 200 miles away? (laughs) Well, that's a pretty easy answer, huh? They'd go out of business. Well, if there's a business near a university making money, then that money really is that university's money, or at least a part of it is. That business needs to help the university financially, or the university needs to compete against that business. In other words, if the Starbucks across the street won't support the university, then the university needs to open their own Starbucks right on the campus because the university brings the customers, the university's customers. Or as my friend Tom Pierce likes to say, it's the school's money, all of it. And that's my soapbox. My guest today is my dear friend, Krista Massey. Krista is one of the top corporate executives in the sponsorship arena. A graduate of the University of Georgia, Krista started her career at First Bell South, then spent time at the Home Depot but before becoming the head of corporate sponsorship at SunTrust Bank. Let's welcome Krista to the bridge. Hey, Krista, good morning. Welcome. Thank you, Rick. Happy to be here. Well, we're glad to have you. Well, we find ourselves in uh, uncharted waters in so many ways, and for you, it's really uncharted waters. Uh, we've got this crazy <laughs> pandemic. Uh, you, you got your boys at home each and every day, all day, every day. Mm-hmm. You've left a longtime position at SunTrust after the merger with bb and uh, You're looking for your next... Uh, uh, your next gig, but we've kind of got this uh, roadblock called the coronavirus. So how are you spending your time these days? Uh, wow, what a time to be um, unemployed, right? <laughs> I um, it, It's kind of funny. I have uh, probably just about run myself out of a marriage and a household by keeping my husband and my two sons busy with every project that around my house has been, oh, we'll get to that one day. Um, So there is that. Um, I do have two teenage sons, both in high school. So I had a crash course in in, uh, human geography, in world history, in algebra two, which took me multiple times in college to get through. So I'm not sure how good I was in helping that, but but honestly, I um I have found myself spending the most amount of my time really trying to be still and be present, um and think about exactly what I want for my next opportunity, and really, as crazy as it sounds, cliche I know, cherish the moments that we have because we have had a lot of bonding and a lot of really really good family time, as I know a lot of people have. And with my kids on the verge of leaving the nest, um, that's been the biggest blessing in all of this. I love the fact uh, that you saw that as a gift. You know, it. Mm-hmm. I talk a lot on this program and other places about how Coach John Wooden was such a mentor to me. And one of the things that he talked about was what he called the precious present. Mm-hmm. And I never got it. I mean, I never really got it until this happened. And then you realize Mm -hmm. it is this moment Mm -hmm. and and that whatever this moment is, you're not going to get it back. And so how are you going to take this moment? Yeah, I think I, I don't think I got it either until this happened. Um, You know, there's the old saying that sometimes God puts you on your back because he really needs you to look up. Um, Being home and being with them is something that, um, I, I will look back at forever as a gift because of the age that they are, the place they are in terms of their own dependence, becoming their own people. But I wouldn't have taken this time if I were still working full time. Um, you know, the first couple of days I about went nuts because I couldn't figure out what time I was supposed to get up and, you know, the thought of not having to get up. But after that, um, I just wrapped my head around the message that I think you know, we were getting, which is, 
um, it's time to reconnect with families. It's time to reconnect with what's important. And so it really has been a huge blessing. And the fact that my parents live right down the street and have been quarantining as well, and they're able to come kind of hang out with us, which a lot of people I know don't have, has helped a lot. It really has. Well, you know, I've got my son now works with us. And Mm -hmm. and, and so it's interesting, you know, I I think back of his teenage years and the things that we tried to do. And then, and then you kind of lose them, you know, they, they Mm -hmm. kind of go off to the desert for a while and they do their thing, but he's come back. And one of the great joys we've had is that his wife, Celia and Ryan, they come over and cook for us once a week. Mm -hmm. This is my son that would not eat anything green ever in his life. You know, (laughs) I mean, his plate was solid white, uh, and now he's, you know, eating kale and, and, and chicken sausage soup that he's made in the kitchen. I'm like, right. I'm like, mm, what alien <laughs> has taken my son? I hope he's having a good time wherever he is because <laughs> this human being is not my son. But it's been a mm-hmm. joy to do that. And and I, I do believe we find our, our ourselves, you know, reflecting on what what matters. And, mm-hmm. and, and I think relationships matter. You know, you mentioned your mom and dad, I think you're an only mm-hmm. child and, and, um, where, where'd you get your love of sports? Um, yeah. So I am an only child, only grandchild and only great grandchild. So my family reunion could take place in, you know, a bathroom basically. <laughs> um, hopefully it wouldn't, but yeah, it could. Um, so, my dad was always really, really involved. Um, my dad was sometimes the only dad at my cheerleading meetings and stuff like that for families. Um, but my mom and dad were both huge sports fans and so were my grandparents. And so, um, you know, when you're, when you're an only child and you don't have cousins or anything else, you tend to want to be in the room with the adults and figure out what's going on. And so, Paying attention to sports is kind of how I connected with them originally. My parents were, when I was very young, um, they were season ticket holders for the Atlanta Falcons. And so one of the one of the fun moments in my career was when I got to meet Steve Barkowski and tell him that I had his jersey as an 11 year old kid. Of course, I was trumped by my husband who was sitting with me and jumped up and said, "Well, I had your pajamas." So, um, you know, it just came from my family and it came from being able to connect with them over that. And, you know, I think it's, I think sports is like, you know, the last really good drama. Um, it's exciting. It's fun. Um, there's always, you know, great moments that you can't even write. They're so perfect. And then there are moments that are just, you know, Greek tragedies in the making, if you will. And so we thrive on, on that energy, I think. My dad, my dad, um, would come home. He was a federal investigator Mm -hmm. and he he would come home and uh, read the Atlanta journal every day before he even talked to anybody. And I noticed he always read the sports page first. Yeah. And I asked him one time, he said, I prefer to read about man's triumphs rather than man's tragedies. Um, <laughs> and, 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 and he had such a love for sport. I'm, you, you talk about being a Falcon season ticket holder. He, he became one, and he was also a Baptist deacon. And, and he, he talked about what he called Falcon Sunday sermons. And those mm-hmm. were when they had a home game at 1 o'clock, he and the other deacons would look up at the preacher and start tapping their watches like <laughs> you need to move this one along because yeah. we got to get to kickoff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> well, we we went um back then the Falcons played in Fulton County Stadium when the Braves were out, the Falcons were in and so uh you know, it was we have a long-standing Atlanta family sports history here, of course. Well, you went to the University of Georgia, and when you got out of Georgia, what, what, where'd you start? Where'd you start your career? I started my career at what, uh, at the time, was Bell South Mobility, which was the cellular uh, wireless arm of Ma Bell. I started in uh, 1993 as a temp. They hired me a couple months later as a permanent employee. Um, I actually started with six weeks of school left to go, so I had to move my classes to Saturday 
because at that time it was virtually impossible to get a job coming out of school in the early 90s. Um, but I was lucky enough to get an opportunity working an install shop window, which is where you bring your phone if it's broken or if you want to have it installed in your car, which is comical to think about these days. Um, but it was, it was a great place to be. The company, um, obviously, the telephone company had been around forever, but the wireless, the mobility arm was relatively new. So most of the people there were, um, you know, young uh, driven. So we had a lot of fun. I, I kind of grew up there, if you will. I, um, and, you know, we ha- I have friends to this day, uh, very dear friends that I met during those early days when you could go to work and, you know, we were paid hourly and we had so much work to do that we often worked overtime and then we'd all go have dinner together. It was, it was an exciting time to be in that business. We were actually there um, when the, uh, when the mobile phone act passed around local number portability and being able to take your phone number from one carrier to the other, it completely opened up telecom. Yeah, Yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun. Well, we, we share something in common. I didn't know uh, before is uh, same thing happened to me. I, I went to student teach um, so I could coach my Mm -hmm. senior year and I got hired without Mm -hmm. a degree, finished the year. I had to go back to summer school um, to keep my job because I was going to be a school teacher and athletic director. And I had to, I had to go back to state spar from St. Simon's and do the commute every day for, right. for classes and all that kind of stuff. You know, it is interesting how early in your career you do meet a lot of people that, uh, are part of your career path mm-hmm. the rest of your life. Um, yeah. and, and, and I think a lot of, I try to tell young people all the time, you know, meet as many people as you can. You know, you don't have to have a new best mm-hmm. friend, but you can. You, you need more friends. <laughs> yeah. You know? Well, I always say we end up spending more time with these people than we do our own families. So it's always uh, it's always easier if you like each other. And there's there's tons of people, different tastes. You can either learn to appreciate their differences or connect with people who are just like you. But there's you know, it's it's amazing to me. I have uh, I have friends that you know were in my wedding friends that were there when my children were born, um, all of which came from those really early days of, of working there. And then I'll tell you the, the best, um, you know, back then the opportunity that was provided to me was incredible, but I also, they actually also paid for my master's degree. So I have a, I have an MBA in marketing from Mercer university and, um, I have, I have Bell South AT&T to thank for that. And it was really great because, the entire class that I went through that program with were all Bell South employees. And that made it, that made it so doable to go to school full time and work full time and have a career. Yeah. I think about a company that's smart enough to try to provide those opportunities for their people because they knew they, they were reinvesting in their people mm-hmm. in a way that just made them better. And especially at a time when that, that industry, as you said, was changing so dramatically. Yeah. Yeah, it really was. It was, um, I think back on it and, and I always thought, especially when I was going to school too, I kept thinking, what am I going to do when I have more time? You find ways to fill the time, no matter what you're doing in your life. But I thought, I, I just, there were times where I thought, how can I possibly do this? Um, but having a great support system from the company that you work for. And of course, from your family and your friends makes it, makes it so easy. And then you, you make a move at that point over to, mm-hmm. to the Home Depot. Mm-hmm. Uh, so talk about that. Yeah, it was, um, I was relatively newly married. My husband and I had been married about a year. And um, I had, from working in, you know, sponsorship and sports marketing, gotten to know all the people in the, in the biz, if you will. And Hugh Miskell, who was the director of sponsorships at Home Depot, called me. And that's the job that, you know, I had at Singular at the time before it became AT&T. And, um, and he offered me a job. He, he basically was looking for a succession plan for his role. And he asked me to come over and, um, and learn the way they do business as well as product placement and other elements that were sponsorship oriented. And to be very candid at that point, I was ready to start a family. And so, um, 
I, I jumped at it. It was a great opportunity. It allowed me to travel a little less. Um, I did travel right up until the point in which my obstetrician said I couldn't anymore on both of my pregnancies while I was there. But um, it was it was really an exciting time to be at the Home Depot as well. I was there when we celebrated our 25th anniversary. Um, it, it, I was, you know, the first the first year that I was there was the year that Tony Stewart won what would be the last Winston Cup. Um, and so it was, it was just a great opportunity that you find people, um, who, who spent time at the Home Depot. It becomes part of who you are. It is very much a culture that you can, that you can connect with and really get invested in. I loved every minute that I spent there. Um, and I was busy. I was there for almost four years and I was really busy. But it was a lot of fun, and I learned a lot. Well, Hugh Miskell is one of my favorite people. I mean, I mm-hmm. you know, you always like to, when you make a move, you like to go to a place where you're going to learn from somebody. You, you know, the, the Home Depot story is such a great story. People forget mm-hmm. that, uh, that, you know, Bernie Marcus and, um, and Arthur Blank had worked for a company in Texas called Handy Dan, mm-hmm. and they both got let go. Fired. Yeah, they got fired, yeah. and they went. Yeah, they'll to, they, say in a heartbeat. Yeah, yeah, they went to a diner and 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 at lunch and made up the Home Depot. And I remember the first mm-hmm. one they opened not far from where I lived in Avondale Estates. And mm-hmm. you know, there's a great story that it was this giant warehouse, and ninety percent of the boxes and the paint cans were empty. Yeah, uh, you know, they just created <laughs> this this look of this warehouse. Um, mm-hmm. But what great leadership uh, yeah. from at the top to build yeah. something unique. I, I, I got to believe those four years were like getting your PhD. Um, in, in, it really in, in was. It really was. And, um, you know, it was, it was amazing to me because it's probably, you know, at the time, the only fortune 500 company where you had you know, the highest level of leadership that had a, that had a high school education and some of the, and some of the leaders because they had come to work there when they were 16 years old picking up shopping carts from the parking lot um, and, and stayed and were so ingrained in the success of the company. And, you know, to this day, um, it's kind of funny. My husband and I were just talking about this yesterday. Um, We were really smart. We took as much money as we could and invested it in Home Depot stock while I was there. We still have it. And uh, wow, it sure is helping right now. We still have every bit of it, but certainly, certainly was, just from a marketing standpoint, not many companies that you could learn that much that fast. Um, and I hope I hope I retained most of it. Well, you had to do at that point. You're in a pretty special place. You you had to leave for something really special. So how did yes. that happen? Um, you know, true story. So funny. Uh, Hugh and I were in California meeting with, we're in Los Angeles, meeting with all of the big movie studios about um, product placement and potential uh, merchandising for the stores. And um, and I got a call. I was in the car with him and I got a call and I didn't know who it was. In fact, then you didn't get 95 million, uh, you know, telemarketers calling your cell phone. You usually answered it. And I did. And it was a recruiter from SunTrust. And I had this really awkward moment where I was like, oh, wow, I'm sitting with my boss and I'm talking to a recruiter. And so I politely got off the phone and, um, you know, and, and it was clearly weird. And Hugh said, who is that? And I just kind of looked at him and I said, well, it was a recruiter from SunTrust. And he said, oh, good. They called you. And I looked at him and said, I'm sorry, what? And he said, well, I gave him your name and number. And I sat there for a minute thinking, am I doing a bad job? And, you know, where do I stand? And he looked at me and he said, you're ready for something bigger and I'm not going anywhere. And it's a great opportunity and it's an Atlanta based company. And he knew that at that point in my career, I was landlocked and he said, you need to go talk to him. And so, um, you know, so I did. Wow. Doesn't that, that, Doesn't that say so much about him? It, it does, I mean, and it, wow. it was it was another leadership lesson for me, and that is um, if you have great people, you want great things for them no matter where they are, no matter where those great things may be. 
And so um, it's something I have never forgotten. But I, you know, I, I tell people um, I had, uh, I was called by SunTrust and recruited by SunTrust, but it took 11 interviews for them to offer me a job. And after the 11th one, I thought, okay, either I'm the only one that can find their way back from the parking deck or they really like me. And so, um, but what I learned during that time is that their culture was so important. And the reason there were 11 interviews is because so many people were going to be invested in this role and everybody wanted to sign off on it. And luckily for me, they did. And so that began a journey that started 14 years ago for me, April of April um, of 2006. You know, I I think culture, in my opinion, is so underrated. It Mm -hmm. it is so critical in organizations. In this pandemic, we're really seeing organizations that had strong culture Mm -hmm. and meant it um, that are going to continue to thrive versus those that didn't have a very good culture that I think are are reeling uh, Mm -hmm. right now. But, But also, when you go into a leadership position, as you did there, now it's your job as a leader to make sure you bring people in mm-hmm. that also understand the culture and will be part of that culture. Talk about that. Cause one of the things that I, I think you do better than anybody is you build great teams. And I, I mean, mm. and I mean that people that Thank have you. worked with you and for you rave about you, you know, you figured out a long time ago, you know, and it's kind of interesting for an only child to figure this out, but you figured it out that it's really a team game mm-hmm. and you got to mm-hmm. get, you got to get good teammates. Talk about how you applied that to recruiting people and bringing people onto your team. Yeah. You know, it's funny you say that. I, I think back to my childhood and I always loved to be around big families. And so I think that it was a sort of, I think it was a learned behavior in my early life, but I um I went to SunTrust at what or some people would argue was the dumbest time on the planet. Um, you know, who knew that the market would completely crash yeah. within, uh, you know, less than 24 months, um, that banks would go through uh, the TARP program, um, the relief program, where which is, you know, Americans we, con- we commonly refer to as the bailout. The truth is I inherited some really good people. And some of those people had not been given permission to do what they do best. And so um, I, you know, I, I think there was only one person that worked for me at the time that didn't stay and, um, and the rest elected to stay as I moved the team around and had them doing some different things and they all thrived. Um, and I think it was simply because I gave them permission to, to do that. I figured out that the first thing I could do was partner with our agency, which you and I both obviously have a very special place for with the late Christy Atkins, who was the owner of the agency at the time. Um, and I made everybody a team, whether they worked for me or whether they worked for the agency or whether they worked for one of my peers and just brought them all along and invested everybody in that success. And um, and then when I had the opportunity to hire more people, I specifically looked for people who were going to fit the culture. I hired somebody who had never had a marketing job before um, simply because She understood the industry and she understood the team and what we were trying to do. And therefore, I knew I could teach her the things that she would need to to learn. But she was from a sales background, so it wasn't it wasn't a big, huge leap. But, um, you know, I, I did a lot of get up and walk around. People don't do that anymore. I mean, obviously, right now we can't do it at all. But in the office, I I sat in my chair very little. Um, My door was not closed very often. It was only closed if I was having a private conversation. But I just walked around and talked to people and said, hey, we're working on this. Um, Do you have any interest in this? Because I've seen you apply what we need to this project. And they would say, yeah. And then before long, I had people coming in my office saying, hey, 
I want to get involved in that project. If you have any, if you need any help, you know, I'm a project manager. I'm not, not necessarily good in sports and sponsorship, but I'm a good project manager. And those are always skills that we need. And so over time, um, it just, it just morphed into a very blurry between who reported to me and who was on my team. They were all on our team. We were all on a team together. Well, and the ability to multiply ideas, uh, you know, I, I think uh, John Maxwell mm-hmm. talks a lot about, about, you know, an idea you have that you share with someone and they bring something and then it gets bigger and better. Mm-hmm. And the ability to create a culture where everybody's opinion matters and that you really get great thinking and that you don't much care where the thinking comes from. There's no yeah. hierarchy. Yeah. It's, it's like you said, it's, it's kind of the team. You, again, in your stint there, y'all did a, a bunch of amazing mm-hmm. things, but what's been your most fulfilling project that you did there? Um, you know, there's a lot that are really near and dear to my heart. Um, but it clearly the biggest would have to have been, uh, SunTrust Park, the new, you know, the, the home of the Atlanta Braves, which of course is now Truist Park. And I still feel equally invested in having served on the transition team for that. Um, and I'm proud of it for a number of reasons. I'm proud of it because, um, we managed to keep it a secret and I don't know that that has happened. Um, I can't think of a, a recent um, you know, uh, naming rights deal that wasn't leaked before it was actually, it was actually intended to be. And we announced it at the groundbreaking. We put that deal together. We started putting that deal together in April, um, put it together very quickly and announced in September that we were going to be the, the, you know, sponsor of the new park. And, um, and that night that we broke ground and announced it, we had thousands and thousands of our Atlanta SunTrust teammates uh, at Turner Field. Um, and they got to do a parade lap around Turner Field and our CEO throughout the first pitch. And it was just, it was a moment that I thought this is like going to be the best thing that happens during this entire um, entire project. And I felt that way right up until the point in which Hank Aaron threw out the first pitch at Centrus Park. It was really special, and it was special because it was something that made our people proud. And after taking such a beating for the bad behaviors of a few during the crisis, um, and not that Centrus was completely without blame, but you know what our people do is noble. I mean, they they help people find, um, start a business. They help people find a home. They help people retire. They do great work and they had been beat up for so long that being able to be part of something that made them really proud of where they worked again, that is why it was so special to me because I I really felt it. I still feel it. Well, this is a great segue for me to ask you another question. It appears to me that one of the great things that happened in that process was your collaboration with the Braves, Mm -hmm. you know, what are properties sometimes not understand about corporations? Yeah. Um, You know, it's funny. I, you know, this Rick, cause I I asked you to come, but I, I was teaching a class on sponsorship and sales as an adjunct professor this semester at Mercer, my alma mater. And I, I spent an entire lecture on the things that I wish I could tell because most of those folks want to go into sports um, sales, into sponsorship sales, the, the people that I had in my class. Um, and one of the things I kept pushing them on is that you can never have too much data, that um, we all are fans and the performance on the field should be very important to you. But our jobs as marketers is not to is not to manage when you are at your best. It's to manage across the entire season, across the entire relationship. And so the more data that we could be provided, the more effective we could be. Once we knew, and, and by data, I don't mean how much our signage was worth 
we know it's worth a lot. What I mean is, what do the fans think about us? How many of them would be willing to consider us? Where are they in the purchase funnel? How can we tap into them more? Um, what other sorts of things are they doing? And one of the things that the Braves do particularly well is their sales team pulls together all of their corporate partners regularly to share ideas. What did you do? What did you do? How did that work? How did, how, how did you think about this? It allowed us to build relationships. It allowed us to build ideas together. It allowed us to do cross promotion and put our dollars together and make them even more efficient. And so I, you know, the biggest thing for me is understanding um, that what you can tell us about your fans and what you can tell us about what they think of us is critical. And you as the property have permission to ask those questions. We as the sponsor don't. And so I just, you know, never have too much data. Well, I talk about fans like all nauseam on this program uh-huh. because the only reason that a corporation would affiliate with a property like the Braves are for the fans. It's mm-hmm. about the children. And and you're right. The, the property has the ability to ask the tribe deeper questions mm-hmm. because they have an affiliation for the tribe and, and then sharing that data back. And I like the idea of the collaborative spirit of, you know, if they put you in a room with other sponsors, y'all might mm-hmm. find some things y'all can do together. Uh, Absolutely. You know, where one plus one equals 10 instead of, you know, two. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. Well, in a time when, you know, resources are scarce period, it's only going to get tighter. Um, that just being able to connect with the with people who do what I do at other companies, not in places where we compete, it opened up so many doors for us. And the more doors that that it opens up, the more successful we view that partnership, the more likely we are to renew. It's honestly just that simple. Yeah, it is. You know, I mean, it's easy to say. It's not always so easy mm-hmm. to do. You got to work at the relationship. You got to work at looking at opportunities. You got to make sure that everybody in your team is always, you know, poised to say, hey, I met somebody today that's affiliated with the Braves that could be a great customer and mm-hmm. and the ability to connect those dots. Um, you mentioned um, – you know, going back and, and after getting your master's at Mercer, going back and teaching, mm-hmm. uh, and one of the things I love about, I've loved about teaching in the over the years, I think you do too, is there's no place to hide. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You can't mail it in with this group. I mean, they, uh-uh. they spot a phony uh, probably faster than ever. And it, it and for me, a really old guy, you're, you, uh, mm-hmm. you, you know, it forces me to stay relevant Mm-hmm. And contemporary with information and all that kind of stuff. But but in dealing with the young people at Mercer, what kind of advice are you giving people, especially now? Mm-hmm. You know, with the economy the way it is and all this. That, that what do what are you what are you telling them today? And the reason I ask that is my son has done a great job of uh, of of promoting our our podcast back to a lot of universities to their students in sports mm-hmm. management to say, hey, this is a free resource. So there's a lot of them out there right now at home worried. Um, mm-hmm. what, what's some, some of your words of wisdom for them? Well, you know, first of all, um, it is so much harder than when I was there, when you were there. Um, it, it, social media, everything that everybody talks about, completely true. Um, but I feel better in so much better knowing that at the end of the day, my fate is in their hands as I get older. Um, and that's one of the things I tell them, you know, so many people are quick to say, Oh, this generation, that da, da, da. we've been doing that since the beginning of time. Um, but these, these people actually care and they care about one another and they care about the, the environment and they care about us. And so um, I start by really trying to, just build them up instead of sending them the message of, you know, when I was in school, we had to walk uphill, whatever, you know, (laughs) um, they've heard that. But the thing that I, the career advice that I have given to them and I teach an upper level class. So all juniors and seniors in my class was really to use every connection you have 
because it's there for you if you if you choose. And so, um, you know, Rick, I brought you in to speak to the class. I brought Jim Allen from the Braves in. I had multiple people come in and speak to the class and um, and everybody offered to help them. And a couple of them took you up on it, right? Yeah, absolutely. A couple of them yep. reached out. No and question. I, and I, I could predict who was going to do it because I knew which students were the most serious about staying in this field. Um, but since then, I have heard from several of them. And it kind of started what, what really got me interested in teaching this class this past semester was I joined an advisory board at Mercer for the sports marketing school, for the sports sales and marketing school and met the very first meeting, a football player who, um, who was so stressed out when he approached me. And he said to me, um, you know, I was a double major in both accounting and finance. And with football season, I had to drop one of my classes. So I ended up dropping one of my majors. And I think I made a huge mistake. And I just looked at him and I was like, no, you didn't. It's okay. You know, he just, he was too busy to have both. Um, but there, his ambition was so just palpable. And I wound up mentoring him for six, seven months up until the point in which he found a job. Um, and by the way, he found a job about two months after he graduated. So it wasn't like he was unemployed that entire time. He was still in school, but he was smart enough to use the resources that had been put in front of him. And so that's what I tell them. I mean, nobody hires, nobody ever looked at a resume and said, oh my gosh, this is the person I have to hire. They might've looked at a resume and called somebody in for an interview, but nine times out of 10, when you're looking for someone, you call those people that you know, that you respect, that might have these kind of people in their network. And, you know, I have a, I have a list of resumes in my inbox that I'm hanging on to for when I see those opportunities to come up to forward to people, because they are some of my students who really put so much into their education. And, you know, most of my students were student athletes. I think 14 of the 15 in my class were that right there says a lot because it is, you know, it is really hard to do. Um, but those that were really driven and wanted just one more opportunity or one more minute to talk to me, it, it, it got my attention and it's, you know, and it's, and now I'm invested in their success too. Well, you've always been someone that has invested your own time and energy into other people and other people's careers. And it continues to do that. So I, I can't thank you enough for being with us today. I mean, great, great stuff. I know, Big things are ahead for you, and uh, mm -hmm. we appreciate you being with us today from the bridge. Thank you. I appreciate it. Let's close today's show on the road with Rick. Now, I like all kinds of places along the road, but the classic roadhouses are my very favorite places, and one such place is the Clam Box in Ipswich, Massachusetts. It's a classic roadhouse design. Literally, the building looks like a paper box that you would fill up with seafood. It was started in 1938. It's uh, just a little north of Cape Ann in northern Massachusetts, near the famous Ipswich Bay. So what do you eat? Well, two words, fried clams, either whole belly clams or clam strips. Uh, they may be the best fried clams I've ever had, and I've eaten them a lot of places. Uh, the sides include things like fries and onion rings and coleslaw. They have really, really good clam chowder, and they have a whole bunch of other fried seafoods, fried fish, fried scallops, fried shrimp, but you want the clams. Thanks for being with us today. I hope to see you next time from the bridge.